Hi, my name is Vicki and I am here with St. Louis Young and Alt BSF. We are going to be looking at Matthew 9 tonight. And so let's pray and jump right in. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for uh, this time that we have to sit before your word and to listen to what you have to speak say to us. And so, Father, we ask that you would, by your spirit, be working in us so that we might hear, that we might understand, help us to understand more about who Jesus is, your son, and uh, would you soften our hearts in the places where they're hard and um, show us how and where our lives need to be brought into alignment uh, with who Jesus is and uh, with your kingdom. And so, Father, would you be with me and be with my words to, uh, I pray, honor Jesus in every way. And uh, yeah, we pray all this in his name. Amen. So this summer, my family and I, we went kayaking up in Wisconsin. We were kayaking on a lake. Um, It was a summer day, a little bit chilly, and we had three inflatable kayaks and one hard plastic kayak. And, um, I was in one of the inflatable kayaks and we were, we needed to paddle across this lake and the wind was against us. We were going into a headwind and we had kind of drifted out into more of the middle of the lake. It was very choppy and the wind was blowing and blowing and blowing and the inflatable kayaks kind of sit on the top of the water. And so it's almost like a sail. <laughs> so you're a sail. I am a sail. There are three of us were straining. And well, I was straining because I was probably the weakest upper arms of the boat of everyone on the trip. And so just going across, I got really fatigued. And I, you know, um, Brett, my husband, um, whom you've probably seen here, had said midway, um, Vic, hey, do you want to trade kayaks? Uh, you know, he was in the plastic one. And uh, I was like, uh, you know, no, I'll be fine. And so I'm, you know, I'm my stuff's all in this one. And what, how are we going to do that? It'd be really awkward in the middle of the lake. To, and, you know, what's it going to, you know, how's it going to work? And so I was like, no, I'll be fine. And so, you know, paddle, paddle, paddle was miserable. My arms are burning. You know, everybody's way ahead of me. And I'm the last one and, um, we finally get across the lake and we get to a lunch spot, um, you know, several hours later, I believe. And, uh, we, (laughs) when we get all out and then Brett taught said, you know, why don't you try the plastic boat and that he had so generously been offering this whole time. And, uh, I was like, all right, fine. You know, it's fine. It had a keel and, uh, I got in it. And it was amazing. It was like night and day when I was, I went from being the slowest person to being the one who was out ahead and had to wait for everybody. Um, It was, it was amazing. And I kept thinking to myself, why, (laughs) what had stopped me from doing this earlier? Of course, Brett was doing fine in the inflatable kayak because he's strong and a better paddler, but um, it like it made me think about, uh, this, I've been thinking about this situation as I've been studying Matthew nine and, um, thinking about the ways that God calls us to leave behind what we know, leave behind, um, the, the things that are comfortable, uh, which also include the hard things, um, sickness, sinfulness, bad habits, unhealthiness, and, um, how he calls us to trust him and follow him in Christ into newness of life. And um, it reminded me what uh, the Christian apologist C.S. Lewis once wrote, that uh, he said, quote, it would seem our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to to us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And so I think just that, have that idea in your mind as we're going into Matthew 9, that Jesus is, we, Matthew has presented us with Jesus, the King, the inaugurator of God's kingdom on earth. And he has 
uh, presented Jesus as compassionate and powerful, uh, the authoritative teacher, the one who is willing and able to free us from our sins and um, from sin's reign. And uh, in that, I think we can learn tonight as we study Matthew 9, 1 to 34, that Jesus sees us. He sees us in our unhealthiness and he has compassion. He calls us to new life. Jesus sees us where we are in our unhealthiness. He has compassion and he calls us to follow him into new life. So um, get a, go ahead and open up your Bibles to, or turn them on to Matthew 9. And uh, we are going to finish up today the first section of Matthew. Uh, the That included, or a highlight of that, has been the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 to 7. And it's been followed by two chapters, or almost two chapters, chapters 8 and 9, or at least through verse 34, of what that Sermon on the Mount looks like, and it's lived out, um, teaching with flesh on it. And so... Um, these are carefully selected stories, trustworthy stories, um, to illustrate the messages and the truths of what Jesus was teaching in chapters 5 to 7. And so if you look, just to give us a little orientation of where we are, um, go to Matthew 4, uh, before the Sermon on the Mount, right before it, uh, verse 23. This sort of, this is like Matthew's chapter heading. It was alerting him us to what was gonna, what was happening in Jesus' ministry, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the, uh, the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Um, and so that uh, he, he had sick people come to him, verse 24, and he healed them. And so we are, uh, that's a summary statement for ch uh, chapters uh, five to seven and eight to nine. And the good news of the kingdom is that God is coming to establish his sin forgiving reign through Jesus Christ. And so Jesus, the compassionate, powerful king, he is able and willing to free us from sin's reign. And so if we look at Matthew um, 935, which is the verse we will not quite get to, but it will start off next off this week, you will see that exact or almost the same verse as in chapter 423. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And so those are our two uh, envelopes that Matthew's given us. And so we're going to see this happening um, in chapters eight and nine or in chapter nine, what we're looking at. Jesus is entering our mess, our unhealthiness, our darkness, our uh, paralysis, and he heals. He brings order where there is chaos and um we will also see that um, our unhealthiness and our unwholeness is bigger. It's more complicated than what we see or realize. Um, but the good news of the kingdom is this, is Jesus sees us. He sees us in our plight. He has compassion on us and he calls us into new life. Um, so let's, uh, we're going to get into uh, verse chapter one, verse chapter nine, verse one. And um, we're going to see uh Matthew has set seven little stories or uh, pericopes is the is the fancy Greek word name for these when there's a little narrative in a, a passage of scripture. And we're going to they're going to be a lot that's happening in these seven uh, pericopes. And because of our time and just um, the beauty of the writing that Matthew has put before us. Um, I'm going to zoom into the first two um, and then Jesus healing a paralyzed man and Jesus calling Matthew. So that's uh, verses one to 13. I will touch a little bit on verses 14 to 34, but please read your notes for more details about the sections. We just aren't going to be able to address um, because uh, it, I think it, it's better for us to go a little bit deeper into these two pericopes to understand what's going on um, in the larger story. And so we're going to see that if as chapter eight revealed Jesus' authority over sickness, demonic powers, and even the wind and the waves in, ch in these verses, in chapter nine, verses one to 34, we see a lot of those same things, but we're going to see more of Jesus' heart. Why is he doing this? Um, what does he want? Um, and we will see it's because God's heart is merciful and gracious. And so Jesus, as the inaugurator of God's kingdom, is extending God's 
abundant grace and mercy to those um, who are unable to help ourselves. And so um, there's, we also are going to see the beginning of opposition. It was predicted, uh, Jesus said in, in chapter 8, verse 11 to 13. Um, but uh, while there is, there's a physical disabilities that we're going to see and other sicknesses can uh, attributed to demonic powers, we're also going to see in this as rising opposition, there is another unseen kind of crippling unhealthiness that is threatening and pervasive. It's rebellion against God that will not respond to his grace, is half-hearted about being in his kingdom and um, being about his business, unforgiveness, pride, a desire to not be inconvenienced or interrupted, Um, and just in the same way that I was wanting to stay in my kayak, even though it was, um, it was the lesser, the far lesser choice. Um, we will see people sadly who do not want to enter God's kingdom, who do not want to see God's sin forgiving, gracious reign to come, um, on earth. Uh, and predominantly we see this in this passage from arising from the Jewish leaders. So with that, let's, um, we're going to jump on in and, um, to the first, uh, section verses one to eight, where Jesus proves that he has power to forgive a paralytic sins and, or a paralyzed man's sins. And so we're going to enter this, this scene, um, this narrative with a setting change in verse one, it's going to help us remember where we were uh, at the end of, uh, chapter eight. And so, uh, verse 34 of chapter 8, remember, uh, Jesus had cast out demons from two uh, very oppressed men um, in a Gentile region, and all the city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. And why? Well, it probably was related to the fact that their their pigs, their livelihood had um, fallen into the, you know, had jumped into the, the, uh, Lake Galilee and, um, they did rather than rejoicing about, um, the two men who were released from this terrible bondage, the people were, seemed more concerned about losing their herd of pigs. And so, um, that kind of asks, we're, I think Matthew leaves that question in the air of, is this a healthy response? But Jesus, we can see in verse one, he goes along with their request to leave. And so here's uh, just a a little map. Um, So here's the Sea of Galilee and the Gadarenes is over on the um, more Gentile area on the northeast side. And so it says uh, in, in Matthew tells us that he crossed over and he came to his own city, which is probably Capernaum. Um, and so Capernaum is, uh, let me see, it's this one, I believe, right here. So it's, when they say crossed over, it is not meaning he went like across the widest part of the lake, but he went over to the other side, which actually was a different political region at that time. Um, and so uh, once he once he gets there, um, <clears throat> He is now among in his own region, and uh, the focus is on his own in the in the Greek. It's his own people, the Jewish people. And so the latent question is, well, the Gentiles responded last to Jesus in a certain way. How will his own people respond to him? We can see verse 2, some respond in faith. They remember what Jesus has done. They've heard about the miracles or maybe even seen them um, in verse 2. Uh, and behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And note that these people didn't come for themselves, but like the Roman centurion that we saw in chapter 8, verses 5 to 13, uh, they came on behalf of someone else who was suffering. And the man that they brought was, uh, we don't know much about him other than he was paralyzed. He could not walk. And um, perhaps that meant he couldn't even move at all. Um, this is the third person that has been brought to Jesus or Jesus has come to that has been cast upon a bed. Um, that's kind of the, the, that's the, the word in Greek is a, has the sense of, of being thrown in a certain um, sense. Uh, and the, there was the centurion servant. It was Peter's mother-in-law and now this man. And so um, when that comes, we're going to see some some surprising thing happen, uh, at least on four four different levels. And so when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. 
And behold, some of the, okay, yep, that's going in the next part. Sorry. <laughs> verse two, let's, we're going to soak into verse two. Um, and so we're going to look carefully at what Matthew tells us. And we know that um, some of the other gospels give us other details. We're going to focus on what Matthew has, uh, what he's setting in parallel for us. So when Jesus saw, um, now we expect when Jesus saw, um, that's not what we're probably looking at. We're not probably looking at the people who brought him the par- the paralyzed man. We're looking at the paralyzed man and expecting that that is what Jesus is going to see. Um, and so Matthew has us see uh, that Jesus looks somewhere that we likely aren't looking at. He looks at something that's largely invisible to us, um, or I mean, it was visible in their actions, uh, but the faith of the friends. Um and perhaps uh, this also included the paralyzed man. Perhaps he also had faith in the in their faith, um, but definitely it was uh, the friend's faith. And faith in whom or what? It presumably in the narrative we're supposed to see that faith in Jesus. They are bringing a problem or a person with a problem uh, is would be a better way to say it to Jesus. And um, so the first, I think, surprising thing we can see of four is that Jesus sees the unseen. Um, Who else does that? Who have we heard (laughs) sees the unseen? Remember, we're we're listening in these stories and these pericopes for connections that Matthew has had with the teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, And so remember when Jesus says, in uh, chapter 6, verse 6, that it is uh, your heavenly Father who sees um, in secret. They, he will reward you when you are praying, and that um, when you're giving to the needy, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And so, in a way, um, this, this act has been done a little bit in secret, in the sense that even we as readers were probably not looking at those friends, we were looking at the man um, in at least in Matthew's narrative. And it shows us what uh, kind of reward Jesus might be talking about. Um, in this case, the answered prayer of intercession. So they're bringing the man to Jesus and hoping and expecting that he will do something. And so um, Jesus saw them and their faith, and he said, the second unexpected thing that happens, um, he said, take heart, dear son or dear child, your, your sins are forgiven. And so that's the unexpected thing. I think we can notice number two is that Jesus knows the real problems. Um, we see the outside problems. Um, even Matthew tells us about that in the paralyzed man. And we expected that's why the friends are bringing him. Um, and that Jesus would fix that real outside problem. But Jesus saw a different problem that we could not see this man had sinned. Um, we don't, Matthew doesn't tell us through Jesus's words or in any other way what that sin was, who he had sinned against, what and what had the sin done to the man, um, had it contributed to his paralysis. Uh, the narrative doesn't tell us that. It just is that he sinned. But Jesus saw not only this invisible problem, and he knew that problem, but he, he also is fixing it. Um, he is meeting that need in compassion. And so we, Matthew is, and we're going to see this throughout these two first pericopes, especially he's setting these two problems in parallel paralysis or unhealthiness and sinfulness. And are they related for the man? The narrative doesn't tell us that. And I would caution us to be, I do not, I suggest to you, the narrative is not making making that causal connection that we are supposed to think, oh, because the man sinned, then that's why he's paralyzed. The narrative doesn't suggest that, but he obviously had sinned in some way um, against God, um, certainly because all sin is a violation of God's good and righteous law. And he's also probably sinned against other people as well. Um, but Jesus is is speaking these words and he doesn't need to give us all the background. Jesus does not need to justify himself to anyone. Um, And so we need to be careful to not um, try to draw too many conclusions uh, or make connections when maybe that is not warranted. The unexpected number thing number three, I think we can see is that um, he 
he has such intimate compassion. Um, his command that he tells the man, take heart. Um, maybe the man was afraid uh, or afraid of even coming to Jesus. And he uses the son, uh, uses the term of endearment that would be to a, a, within a family from a father or a mother to a, to a son. Uh, the ESV translates it, my son. The, the Greek word doesn't have that word my in it. Um, so it, it just, it is a family term. It's not wrong to translate it, my son. Um, but it, it could, it's just a, it's a term of endearment and establishing this is a family matter. What's happening here between Jesus and that man is a family matter. And Jesus is acting on the father's behalf. Um, and so if you think about it, what, um, what did Jesus teach his disciples to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapter six. Um, it, he's saying our, it's, we're pray to our father in heaven. This is a family issue. And when we sin against God, which all sin is against God, um, or we owe him things for our offenses, Jesus is teaching us in verse 12 and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And so, um, the father's sin, uh, the father's forgiveness to the son, the paralyzed man, came through Jesus, and I think we need to we need to definitely take note of that. Um, and so, the the next thing that happens, um, we're done with verse two, but now we see some, some surprising things. Number uh, number four, and this the focus shifts in verse three. It begins, and behold, um, that's a way of of Matthew alerting us, like one, pay attention here, but also. The, there's going to be a little bit of a shift in focus. Some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your mat, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. Uh, okay. So the, again, this new focus in view, Matthew doesn't tell us why there are scribes there. They're just, they're just there and they're hearing, they're listening, they're in, um, Jesus' presence. The gospels tell us a little bit more background, but, um, we get to hear on the inside something that maybe was just even whispered among them or even in their own thoughts, um, that they're thinking when Jesus said that in kindness and compassion, that family language, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven, that um, that is blasphemy. Now, blasphemy is when someone speaks falsely of God or of the things of God, his sacred things. And so this word is a very sig significant word. It's a not only is it a big accusation um, for someone to think that, um, but it's very significant in Matthew. Matthew uses this word only twice. And the first time is here. And the second time, this is the start of the opposition that is coming to Jesus. The second time is in Matthew 26, 65, when the high priest says it at Jesus' trial. And he condemns Jesus um, at that at that point of blasphemy. And so this is the heart of the objection against Jesus uh, by those who will oppose him, predominantly the re religious leaders at that time. Um, and they're thinking Jesus, Jesus is overstepping his authority. Uh, their good theology says only God forgives sins, which in one sense is true. And um, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit more, but look what Matthew sets in parallel for us. And, um, he, he says, uh, they see Jesus and they, or they, they're, he, they're witnessing this and they say he blasphemes and that's set in parallel. Jesus names that to say thinking evil in their hearts, meaning this, even though, uh, there was probably, there was truth in their theological understanding that they, um, only God is the one who can forgive sins against God. Um, but, uh, they didn't have honest theological questions because evil means against God, um, wickedness. And so just as Jesus saw what was really going on with the friends and the man, so too did he see what was going on in 
these uh, scribes that he knew their thoughts. And he, he asked them two questions in parallel, and it's helpful to ponder the answers. Uh, why do you think evil in your hearts, he asked, uh, which makes us think you don't have to think evil and you shouldn't think evil, but why are you? Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Um, there is something, there is a heart problem that is wrong. It's maybe not a theology problem that they have. It is a heart problem. And then he asks them um, a comparative question for which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk. And so easier, easier in what respect? Um, it seems like Jesus is saying what, to, what is easier to say something and make it happen. Um, and the, so the second thing that, or sorry, the first thing, um, that Jesus said was that, um, his, his sins were forgiven. And so presumably perhaps they thought, well, that's harder. That's the harder thing. Um, I'm sorry, that's the easier thing to say. The harder thing, um, may be to say rise and walk. And so, um, set, Jesus then said that the thing to the paralyzed man, um, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And the man exactly did that. Um, he rose and he went home. Um, and the, this definitely is, uh, just to name it, this is a miracle. Matthew is, uh, claiming that Jesus supernaturally healed the man with his words. Um, and I want to acknowledge that this, uh, may be difficult for you to take seriously, to believe that is a trustworthy account of what happened versus a fable or a fairy tale. Um, you could have honest questions about this. And certainly, um, if you do not, uh, and, and other people that you and I know probably also would have, or probably would have questions and would doubt the, doubt the supernatural. Um, and so I don't want to sweep aside honest questions about this. Um, I, would be happy for anyone in St. Louis. I'd be happy to dialogue with you about that and help wrestle with it. Um, and I just want to name it. Yes, it does sound crazy. And that is exactly the point I suggest to you. Um, although I've never seen anything, like, something like this with my own eyes. And Matthew, we can tell, was not an eyewitness at this time. He wasn't in the picture until the very next um, verse 9. Um, but he certainly, we can assume talked with people who had seen it happen. Um, and most apostles, uh, Matthew included, were willing to die and did die uh, to say that these things, Jesus did these things, including, um, as we will get to, to resurrect from the dead, that he died, he was completely dead, and he resurrected from the dead. Um, and the point is, Yes, this is a big deal. Um, and Matthew is saying that Jesus is the only one who could do this. Um, so the second thing that was uh, the second thing that he said, rise and walk, had just happened. And so what it seems like Jesus is offering that is visible proof that the first thing, the invisible thing, had been done. The man's sins against God had truly been forgiven. And not only then, if that is true, not only then did the man go home on his own power, he, you know, maybe he had never done that before in his life. Um, but I suggest to you that spiritually, this son in by Jesus' power was returned to home, fellowship with God, his heavenly father. Um, so the, and I, just a brief comment here that you may know the son of man, has authority on earth to forgive sins. The Son of Man is Jesus' preferred name for himself. Um, it's an ambiguous term from the Old Testament. <clears throat> it can mean just a man uh, in Numbers 23, 19, for example. Um, but it also can mean uh, a, from Daniel 17, 13 to 14, that this is the Messiah King, the glorious King and Judge who would come to establish God's kingdom on earth. And so the miracle of the paralyzed man proves that Jesus was, in fact, not blaspheming when to pronounce the man's sins forgiven, that he is he is claiming to be that that um, son of man in power and authority, um, like he will say in Matthew 26, 64. And so there are two groups there to just wrap up this pericope. There's two groups there to witness that. And the first group um, is talked about in verse eight, when the crowds saw it, 
when he saw this, uh, what had happened, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Um, and so this is a parallel that is in set with the people in the gatherings in chapter 834. And so um, unlike the people in that region, this these people were afraid, it seems like, in a good way, in a reverent way. It caused them to glorify God. And they glorified God. What about this? Who had given such authority to men? Wait, what? A, wait a minute. Why would they say that to men? Well, and not to the Son of Man, to Jesus. Do they miss the point? Um, they might have, uh, in part. But think about this to illustrate the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Um Jesus is unique in being able to heal paralysis with a word. And so he is unique to be able to forgive sins with the authority um, that God has given. He is just like the Father. And so, um, but as Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, in that same place in chapter 6, um, forgiveness is not for God alone. Um, we, as those of us who by grace through faith in Christ are in the kingdom of God, we too have an obligation to forgive um, people. And it's not a forgiveness that allows people to be saved um, when we forgive them, but it is the right thing for us to do. And it, uh, it is a responsibility God has given to all of his image bearers. Um, and it's, in fact, verse 14 and 15 in chapter 6 really reiterate how important that is. Uh, and we will see that even later on in Matthew. Uh, this is not a side point. Um, to be in the kingdom, it means to have a heart like, be transformed by God's forgiveness so that we would be forgivers, that we would extend God's grace, um, and that we would be more like the, the friends who believed that Jesus could deliver the man from his problems and that we would not only forgive people who had wronged us, but then even pray for them, to pray for our enemies, um, as Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, that we would be motivated to ask, to seek, to knock um, for the Lord to forgive them and to deliver them from the bondage of sin. Um, so God's kingdom in Jesus has forgiveness at its very core, and it does invite us to ask questions about bondage, um, that sin and paral paral paralysis, and we will see uh, also uh, sickness and, and death even, are being set in parallel uh, with, uh, with, uh, with sin, offense against God and others. And so we have to, we have to, I suggest to you this pericope asks or opens the question, um, in what ways does sin keep God's people from going home, from being restored to right fellowship with our heavenly father? And so what was, if we just reflect on it, what was the core problem of the paralyzed man? The core problem was that he had sinned against God and needed to be forgiven. And this is not to make light of his, the severity of his plight of being paralyzed. Um, but it, the point does not seem to be to teach us causality, but rather a lesson of degree and to say, you know, Jesus is saying, which is the easier thing to say? Well, what is the, e what is the greater problem? Jesus dealt with the greater, then he dealt with the lesser problem. The greatest problem was, just as it is for you and me and for all humans who have been born um, in this world, at, that our greatest problem is that sin has estranged us from God, that we have been born into a state where we are rebellious against God, and then so we rebel against God, and that uh, against a holy God and his justice does, demands, uh, his righteousness demands justice. And yet God has compassion. God has compassion on us in our plight that we can't move closer to God. He moves closer to us as he did in Christ Jesus. And so just as, um, Jesus then had saw the man and had compassion on the man. And so a principle, I think that we can learn is that Jesus has the power to break all the cords that bind us. Jesus has the power to break all the cords that bind us. If you are a sports fan, um, you are familiar with championship games and championship tournaments. Um, we're in, in America, we're in the, we're in the football season. And so we're getting closer to determine, um, you know, how is that, how's the, there's going to be one final winner and the way it's structured in championship 
situation is that um, you're trying to find which team is better, stronger, faster, smarter. Um, and so two teams go head to head in um, game kind of competition and one team will come out the loser and one team will come out the victor. And so what I suggest to you that these stories are, are illustrating for us is that no matter the strength of who is or what is going up against Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, the King, they, if you oppose Jesus, you will lose. Jesus is always stronger. Jesus has the power to break all the cords that bind us. He will always be the victor. And you might think, yes, okay, he's able, but is he willing? Is he willing to deliver me? Because I have not. Do I deserve that? Um, these chapters, I suggest to you testify in about who is Jesus. He is the one who sees the real you. He sees the you that's unseen. He sees the real problems that you have, and he responds with compassion and with the authority that God gave him. And so you even see this going on in the next pericope, verses 9 to, to 13, that um, Jesus called Matthew out of the, what bound him um, as a tax collector in verse nine, he was, he was probably corrupt. He was certainly disliked. He was known as um, associating with sinners and sinful habits and um, in that era. And so, but that did not keep Jesus away from him. In fact, Jesus passed on and he saw Matthew sitting at the booth and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And then it seems the first thing that Matthew did in his new life that he had with Jesus was to have a party where he invited all of his friends um, who happened to be the people who were who were like him. And so as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And that, of course, uh, is the way that they ate at that time, the reclining that you would actually sort of lay down on, on one elbow in the uh, triclinium on the table uh, or around the table. And then when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, so they were probably trying to sabotage them. Uh, but when Jesus heard it, he heard it. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I came not to call the righteous, Jesus says, but sinners. And so you and I have been born in sin and sin is punishable by God and deserves his wrath. God could have walked away and left us in our, our sin, brokenness, and death, but he didn't. He had compassion and mercy, and he sent Jesus to save us from our sins, as his name declares uh, in Matthew 1, 22. Um, and Jesus comes. He acts. He is the Son of God who pursues, who calls, who heals, restores, forgives, and gives life. And it is God's gracious gift, we learn elsewhere in the Bible, to count that God counts belief in Jesus to stand in place of perfect righteousness, um, that it is entrance into God's kingdom is a complete gift when we, by God's grace, uh, trust by faith in Christ. So if you look to Jesus in faith, you belong to him. And that means he, he ultimately will rescue you from everything that has a hold on you and binds you in unhealthiness. And he promises to give you life and not just a shadow of life, um, not even a holiday at, at the seashore, but life in the most glorious and whole abundance that you can imagine. Um, and that, of course, is not promise of like wealth and prosperity in this present circumstances, but it calls us to wait for him. Those are the future blessings uh, of that he will give to us when we are restored to him and we see him face to face. This is what God has been promising uh, that Jesus will do from Genesis 3.15 on, and he is a God who works through process um, and on his own timing. So will you have faith? Will you trust him? Uh, what is binding you? What is weighing on you? Uh, if you belong to Jesus by grace through faith, he will never abandon you. And will you ask him to meet you in the places where you are, um, you are being in sickness and unhealth, in darkness, in um, pride, in unforgiveness, and in anger, in lust, um, and 
ask him to come into those spaces and speak truth and healing uh, to you. And we also see uh, this in other ways in this chapter, just looking brief, very briefly ahead. Um, And so verse 14 to 17, we're going to see Jesus is uh, bringing truth to what seems to be honest questions for John the Baptist's disciples, 18 to 26. Uh, We're going to, we see a beautiful uh, true story of Jesus acting with compassion to a grieving father, uh, a a ruler, probably of the synagogue and uh, a desperate bleeding woman, and then the dead daughter. um, And he healed and and raised to life. Uh, We see in verses 27 to 31, he healed two blind men of their blindness, and he allowed them to affirm their faith. Um, And then in verses 32 to 34, I'm sorry, 33, he released a mute man um, possessed by an evil spirit. And so we know Jesus sees us in our unhealthiness, in our darkness, in our hard places, um, and he has compassion and calls us into new life. Um, However, There is a second response, and um, we can see it at the very, the culmination in verse 34. Uh, The Pharisees said he casts out demons by the prince of demons. That's the extreme part of it. We also have, we just read um, that the, this uh, kind of snarky question in verse 11, that the Pharisees saw it. And we also see in verse, uh, in the first pericope, when Jesus heals the paralyzed man, um, the the scribes, what was their response? It was nothing. It was silence. Uh, at least that's what Matthew, uh, the, the story tells us. So what's the core problem with the scribes? Just like the paralyzed man, they had multiple problems. Um, they had sinned against God, but rather than being trusting in Christ or um, being in a place where they could recognize that, they uh, they took a wrong posture to Jesus and they refused to see beyond their their theology. They saw theological problem and not the friend's faith, not the man's plight, or not, most importantly, they did not see Jesus. Yet Jesus had compassion on them too. And so he gave them a visible proof of his authority. Um, and so we can see that Jesus does pursue sinners. Uh, and some of that pursuit is rebuke. And he gives them an opportunity. It's compassion. They were spiritually uh, blind to their condition. They were paralyzed. Uh, they were uh, spiritually dead and yet, and and spiritually mute. And yet um, Jesus pursued them and called them to turn away from those things that bound them. Um, they were really very sick and sinful, even though they thought they were righteous and spiritually healthy. Um, and so verse 12 to 13, as we uh, wrap up here, is uh, crystallizes, I think, uh, another pro- or another principle that we can learn. Jesus calls people to get on board with his plan. Jesus calls people to get on board with his plan. Um, he, uh, what is his plan? It's expanding his kingdom, showing mercy and compassion to others, turning to him for faith, in faith, for light and true life. That's what Jesus called Matthew to. That's what he called the Pharisees to and John's disciples. Jesus beckons to those in dark thinking, know me and be with me. And uh, it it does, I think, warn us, um, especially those of us who are uh, close to God's word and familiar. Um, the problem in Hosea 6 is the verse that Jesus quoted um, from the Greek Old Testament, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Uh, that goes on to say, um, I desire knowledge of God not whole burnt offerings. And so even though the God's people at that time, um, when Hosea was speaking, they liked some of the things about God, but they didn't want to know God. They didn't want to have characters and lives that were transformed by him. And if we're honest, uh, I think for many of us, that is a problem for us too. We forget our own need for God. We tend to be critical of other people who are you know, less, uh, you know, don't know the things, the uh, ways that God wants sec- people to live sexually or um, relating to money or uh, what kind of things he wants them to buy. Um, and we can tend to preference external behaviors that are easy for us um, and settle more comfortable um, 
And the, the key problem is we don't naturally desire the things that God desires, and we don't naturally know who God is. We have to be learn. We have to learn and be shaped by His grace, and it calls us to be humble, to be children, um, and to be teachable. So, uh, as we wrap up, I wonder how does this sound to you? Do you hear Jesus' invitation? What is he calling you to leave behind? And are there darkened areas of thinking where um, you are wanting to earn God's favor or you're wanting to have your own way and then uh, or you're embarrassed about the you know, ways that Jesus is and you only like some parts of Jesus? Um, getting on board with God's plan ultimately means knowing him and, so, and being with him. When you study the Bible, do you study to master the text or be mastered by him? Um, Jesus sees us in our unhealthiness. He has compassion on us and he calls us into new life. We should trust him. We should respond with great, with humility and faith. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us, you pursue us, and you have given us everything we need in Christ Jesus for life and holiness. And we pray that you would transform us, that we would uh, to know you truly, and that our lives would be so transformed by your forgiving us that we would be generous uh, to forgive others and to pray for them and to bring them to your son, the Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.